Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. On today's episode, we discuss how our natural world affects our lifestyle and our human health. As physical therapists and other licensed health providers, we often use integrative and lifestyle medicine approaches to reduce chronic conditions. We do that by educating people about healthy nutrition and eating patterns, ways to move your body and exercise and become more physically active, how to sleep more soundly, and how to improve your social connections and even how to mitigate and manage stress. However, as we start to look at the amount of chronic disease that exists not only in the United States of America, but globally, it becomes apparent that we need to look further upstream at the factors that influence not only our lifestyle, but also influence the health of our globe, the health of our environment, and the health of our natural world. Here to speak with us about how our natural world affects our human health is Dr. Philip Marriage and Dr. Todd Davenport. Dr. Marriage is a professor in physiotherapy at the Arctic University of Norway and the founder and executive chair of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association. His interests include the outer rims of healthcare and physiotherapy, specifically philosophy, ethics, environmental health, and planetary health. Dr. Todd Davenport is professor and vice chair with the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. His scholarly interests include design, implementation, and evaluation of population health programs to improve healthful physical activity and nutrition with a special emphasis on improving health equity by lowering structural barriers to good health. On today's episode, we discuss why we need the tonic of wilderness and how environmental influences impact our health. Okay, without further ado, let's begin and let's learn how planetary health affects our collective as well as individual health. Hey there, Todd and Philippe. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. It's great to have you here. Good, uh, thanks for the invitation. Good to be here. Yeah, appreciate you having us. Very, very new topic for our profession. I just have to say that off the top of the, the podcast here. And I you know, commend you guys for bringing the topic of um, lifestyle medicine, the environment together. Um, we're just starting to address this in significant ways, I think, in our profession. But it's something that we can't ignore as a profession, obviously, um, citizens of the world can't ignore either because it has implications on our health. I'm curious to know as physical therapists, how the two of you became interested in this important topic. Yeah. So I, for me, I think I can identify three somewhat sort of significant points, uh, uh in, in this regard. Um, so, um, I, first and foremost, really simple. I always like being outdoors. I just, you know, like the environment, just enjoy being outdoors. That's that's a simple baseline. Uh, the other part is that during my PhD uh, studies, I was looking into some questions of ethics and physiotherapy. And the thing that struck me there was that we seem to be missing considerations about ethical responsibility for anything beyond the kind of individual human body in our professional understanding of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and um, And, that lingered with me for a while. Um, and then after my PhD, I went into clinical practice um, because I just wanted to break from academia for a while. And in clinical practice, I uh, found myself in clinical spaces and treatment spaces that seemed really, really divorced from anything remotely resembling the natural environment. And putting those three bits together at that point in time really sort of um, yeah, triggered me to pursue this uh, path and this topic and start exploring in, in yeah, yeah, for in, in a bit more of a sort of serious way, I guess. Yeah. So those are my, my three, you know, being liking being outdoors, the, the ethics questions, and some issues that I've observed and experienced in, in treatment spaces. Yeah. You know, Philip's Phillip, story is, is somewhat, somewhat familiar to me. So I sort of grew up outside, uh, spent a lot of time fishing and camping when I was a kid and growing up in the Pacific Northwest in the United States, there's just a lot of places to be outside. 
Um, and then being uh, sort of exposed to, um, you know, some of the, the issues that came up in the, the 80s and the 90s when, when the spotted owl went on the, uh, the endangered species list and how that sort of, um, you know, the, the, the goals of conservation and commercialism clashed uh, in a very big way. Uh, and sort of growing up in that, in that milieu, um, you know, having friends who after high school got into uh, organizing uh, with environmental groups, uh, doing mediations between, you know, various different companies that are um, sort of tasked with extracting nat natural resources and, uh, and environmental groups, um, sort of having that, that background from, from sort of my friend group. And then um, fast forwarding a good number of years and sort of still still being outside and still really in, enjoying and, and, and appreciating the natural world, uh, doing a master's degree in public health and, and doing an entire sort of curriculum on environmental health and realizing, wow, um, if we look at this in a very human centric way, very anthropocentric way, um, not only is environmental degradation bad for the environment and the critters and the, <laughs> the, and the plants, uh, but it's bad for us, uh, and it makes it very difficult for us to maintain our own health uh, as humans. So um, this is sort of where I think Philip and I found common cause um, to to start talking a little bit more about, you know, how the environment impacts um, health, human health, and how human health impacts the environment, and how physiotherapy can be involved, and uh, sort of was the genesis of our of our work together. It's interesting because you both have now mentioned kind of this. Um, paradox between, you know, we have this trend towards precision and personalized medicine, which is going to continue to trend, but you guys are uh, expanding that conversation in a, in a much broader way. And somewhat the topic pulls you away from personalized or precision, precision medicine, but in a lot of ways, it still keeps it squarely um, within that space. I want to come back to that, to that later, but as I mentioned in the introduction, the two of you authored a, a chapter um, on environmental health and an upcoming textbook called uh, Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine for the Physical Therapist. You have a lot of great background information on kind of where we've come as a globe, as a society, um, culturally, with regard to, um, as you mentioned, public health and environmental health. Where did things kind of start to go wrong for um, us as a, a planet and a species where we now have a focus on this topic of environmental health, which impacts our public health? Yeah. I've, I've... <laughs> so I think in, historically that we can identify a few different points in human history when things started to go kind of wrong. Um, ultimately, you know, if you if you have a little bit of a look through human history on on this planet, uh, we've not been around for that long compared to to our planet. Actually, our planet's been around for some four billion years ish, um, while humans have you know really successfully only been around for the last eleven thousand years roundabout. Uh, and that's because of some particular environmental uh, conditions that have been present during kind of the last 11,000 years, if you will, which is the Holocene epoch, um, which was also marked or characterized by a relatively stable climate uh, that kind of closely fits what is defined as the human niche uh, uh, climate wise and um, a uh, great degree of biodiversity, which means availability of food and resources and so on. And um, during that time, how, you know, while these environmental conditions were present or kind of evolved, um, we have unfortunately also evolved some not so great practices, which uh, you could kind of place around uh, the beginning of animal and plant husbandry. And when we really started large scale farming, both animals and plants and so on, and really changing how we interact with the other uh, beings we, we share this planet with. Um, fast forward a few thousand years forward, uh, a really, really significant point in time, uh, about uh, what, 400 and something years ago would be the rise and really sort of uh, peak also later on of, of European colonialism going out into you know from from a, from an increasingly industrializing europe and an increasingly mobile europe uh, countries and places uh, going into other countries nations continents and so forth 
uh, and and uh, ultimately extracting both human and natural resources for kind of an acceleration in, in consumption and production um, in, in the, around the world. And then you fast forward from that and then kind of colonialism and the processes that came with it eventually, you know, made possible industrialization and then eventually also the extraction of uh, fossil fuels for, for um, global use. And that, of course, is sort of the famous uh, marker of when things started to go really wrong, you know, of burning of fossil fuels uh, as, as one of the key drivers, of course, of global warming today, climate change, etc. So some points like that, you know, like really early on, particular ways that animal and plant husbandry has developed, colonialism as a significant marker, and the things that it enabled, if you will, industrialism, uh, uh, fossil fuel use, etc., uh, the economic systems that came with all of that, and the effects that this has constantly, all of these practices have on the environment and human health alike. So I think those are some historical pointers. Yeah. What's the relationship between uh, our global health, our ecosystem, and as we start to look at physical therapy practice in the natural environment? Yeah, if, sorry, Todd, if I just jump on this one as well, but feel free to then fill in also, please. Um, so when I started thinking about this environmental physiotherapy idea, my question really for myself was, well, what is actually the relationship between the environment and health and then specifically physiotherapy? You know, just because of the fact that we don't have a lot of explicit thinking about this relationship uh, in our profession so far, or that we haven't had anyway. So in the beginning, when I started thinking about this, you know, and started discovering a few different ways that things relate, and then started talking to people, I would frequently try and justify by pointing out, you know, uh, different ways that environment and physiotherapy relate. Um, now we are about four years ish since I started having these conversations with people, um, and. To be honest, over the last year and a half, maybe, uh, the question has turned around for me quite a bit. So sorry if this is a kind of evasive answer, but my question is increasingly, or my response to the question has increasingly become a return question uh, in the sense of, well, which part of physiotherapy does not have something to do with the environment in one way or another, right? Because if you start thinking about any bit in physiotherapy, anything we do, anywhere we are, any, any kind of, you know, area of research, practice, or education, you're going to struggle very hard to not find out relatively quickly that somehow all of it is related to the environment in one way or another. You know, wherever we are in practice, we're using natural resources or some kind of, you know, other resources and that has an implication or an you know, footprint, if you will, on the environment. Uh, if we're treating in a clinic space, as I mentioned, we're treating in a particular kind of environment, which is different to other kinds of environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in reality, uh, if you're in a hospital, that has something to do with the environment that you're in, you know, be it natural or not, and so on. So in reality, first and foremost, everything in physiotherapy and everything related to health has something to do with the environment. It's where we live, it's where we move, it's where we thrive and hopefully laugh and sometimes also struggle. And, um, and uh, it's really, uh, the question is a near impossible one to answer. It's easier to answer by pointing out that there's nothing that doesn't relate. <laughs> but uh, maybe other thoughts from Todd, yeah. Well, just to hop on, um, Joe, it's, it's striking because, you know, in lifestyle medicine, one of lifestyle medicine is, of course, a lot of things, but one of the things it has a great focus on is reducing chronic disease burden. And when you look at the, the effect of the environment on health, what you come to realize is that well, what we've induced the environment to do to us based on how we treat the environment is bad for our health. So, for example, you know, uh, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's an increased risk of asthma, increased risk of cancer, just based on the pollutants that we put out um, into the environment. And so if, if we really put ourselves out there as, as, as physios, uh, among other clinicians who are interested in this lifestyle medicine, then we have to think about the environment. Because really, at the end of the day, what we do, if we don't think about the environment, the, the cost is 
that we undo all of the great work that we're doing with our patients, <laughs> right? So, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're basically ignoring a potentially big piece of the puzzle uh, for, for people. And, 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 and chiefly, uh, arguably, the people who need it the most, because uh, the folks who are most likely to come into contact with environmental pollutants are people from lower socioeconomic strata. Um, you know, people who live in places with unfavorable zoning laws that put them nearby industrial commercial um, areas, um, you know, places that are, are likely to be to have less green space, um, which can which can independently reduce one's risk of, of you know, non communicable diseases writ large. Um, and also, um, <laughs> these neighborhoods are hotter. <laughs> so we talk about global change or climate change. Uh, just the fact of, of the built environment uh, where, where people where people reside uh, can actually uh, have a compounding effect. So, uh, lots of lots of reasons I think lifestyle medicine practitioners like physios should be interested in this topic. Yeah. Sorry, no, it's just I just had another thought. Sorry if I'm just uh, still on this question. I think this question is really important. Just that fundamental question about the relationship between environment and health and physiotherapy, right? Like, so in today's world, we're increasingly, I, would, I hope, uh, aware of, or already aware of, or becoming aware of uh, problems like global warming, uh, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, you know, pollution of all sorts, and the if effects that this has on health. Uh, and then also, you know, what Todd just mentioned, these kind of unequal distribution of these health impacts. But I think like even at a more fundamental level, it's really, really important uh, that next to that somewhat uh, worrying piece of information or bulk of information that we, you know, that we talked about there, there is also this really, really fundamental piece of knowledge that we maybe need to remind ourselves of. Uh, and that we can go to, for example, by thinking about anatomy or physiology, if you will, you know, how is the environment related to health? Well, we breathe oxygen, you know, how is oxygen produced and so forth? You know, we're, we're related to the environment at such a fundamental physiological and even anatomical level. It just goes past us because it's such a sort of matter of course, we forget how fundamental that actually is that somehow, you know, my joints, you know, certainly, okay, my elbow might be made for having, you know, this range of motion, what from 180 degrees to, you know, whatever it is in, depending on what I have available. But in reality, the function of this elbow, it's functional anatomy is not that range of motion. It's that I can reach for my cup, you know, in my environment or, you know, reach for whatever else, move to someone else with my legs and so forth and interact with my environment. So, just really fundamentally, we're entirely environmental creatures, you know, critters, whatever we are, beings. Uh, and, and it's really important that also, like for me, at least in this new field, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, is that we look at the, the range of that, right? Like there is this fundamental way that we're related to the environment. Us humans have done something in the world to change how our environment now is and what it's doing to us. And that has really grave impacts for the environment and for our health. And here we find ourselves doing a podcast about that. <laughs> right. So really what you're saying is, is biochemistry doesn't happen in a, in a beaker in a lab, basically, is that the biochemistry of the planet impacts our individual or um, larger group biochemistry, basically. And we've all heard things like pollution showing up in, let's say, the cord blood of a, a newborn baby, let's say. Um, polycyclic amines and hydrocarbons which show up in um, fetal tissues. And obviously, that's now in a newborn child. What types of impacts is the change in, the, you know, in, a, in really human physiology at an early age? Have we been able to identify that those changes in human physiology at an early age do actually lead to other conditions and what are those conditions? You know, we do, we do talk about in the, uh, uh, in the, in the book chapter, uh, certainly the example I think we brought up was cardiovascular disease uh, and how, you know, exposure to um, exhaust from living near a busy road uh, can predict one's um, incidence of cardiovascular disease later on. Um, and so certainly that's, that, that's something that's, that's known. Um, 
there are certain uh, environmental pollutants, of course, that are that are teratogenic uh, that can cause birth defects. Um, and uh, so there's there's definitely some um, some literature out there to suggest that or that early life, um, uh, you know, sort of exposure to pollutants can certainly uh, can certainly cause problems. And I and I think too, uh, what what's a little bit less known, but you know, is an area for for. Uh, for future research, and there may be some some research out there that I'm not thinking of that to, off the top of my head, is epigenetic modification uh, related to um, environmental exposures, uh, and you know some of the concerns, potential concerns there that there actually may be um, uh, you know effects of you know um, environmental contaminants uh, that can be transmitted to future generations. So certain compounds, for example, may have um, obesogenic impacts on uh, human physiology. Absolutely. Where they can. Yeah, and, I, and I think, again, you know, strengthening the argument here that, that you know, thinking about the environmental milieu of the lifestyle uh, should be a, a consideration for the lifestyle medicine practitioner. Mm -hmm. So it's, it starts me thinking about our, like our, our clinics, our hospitals, our medical systems who are, quote unquote, providing health. Um, are they set up in an environmentally friendly way to, okay, they're maybe treating the individual, but once the individual then goes out into the community or out into the environment, are they contributing or subtracting necessarily from um, public health in some way, or do we know that yet? Well, we know that, uh, that certain, that hospitals uh, participate in environmental contamination and, you know, some of it related to uh, the lack of recyclable, reusable packaging, some of it related to uh, carbon emissions, uh, actually, hospitals are a, a large source of, car of carbon emissions. Um, environmental contaminants based on uh, based on waste of different different types. Um, so even as hospitals are managing disease, <laughs> as you point out, we're using health with health heavy air quotes. They're managing disease. Uh, they actually may be creating some of the disease that they manage, which is the the great paradox of our our medical system. I think the the interesting there, thing there is that the, that at the moment, quite thankfully, uh, there is a, a growing movement internationally uh, to look at the environmental footprint of healthcare systems and healthcare services in general, and really try and reduce that. And and as Todd mentioned, you know, hospitals uh, are one of the bigger issue. Uh, medication production, both production and consumption, uh, is another big issue. Um, if you look at the National Healthcare Service in the UK, uh, released a report, with, I believe, uh, last year or the year end of the year before, or something like that, about their measures of uh, the healthcare system environmental footprint, especially carbon footprint uh, there. Uh, and they found, of course, that you know the big ones were hospitals and then medication, as we mentioned, and there was a bunch of smaller ones. Uh, as a physiotherapist, for me also, the interesting thing was that, uh, I, if I recall correctly, uh, they, what they found to be the total carbon footprint of the healthcare professions or allied health professions, as they're called there, um, was around 2% of the total uh, calculation. Um, so that, that suggests something fairly significant to us physiotherapists, which we might be able to talk about a bit more. Uh, but to be fair to those kinds of reports and measures, they haven't really factored in fully or really calculated healthcare professions footprint in a lot of detail yet. I think that kind of work is still to be done, but we are in a time, again, just to emphasize that where awareness is increasing about the fact that healthcare systems try and do something good for health, but have also some really, really negative implications or kind of impact on the environment, which is not good for health. And so people are increasingly looking at that and trying to address that. Yeah. So then where, where do we sit as a profession? And obviously people are coming to us for a particular service. Are we contributing to um, global decline and, and poor environmental health? Or are we in some way um, you know, impacting in a positive way? I think we're just as much as any other health service and really any other service and 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 yeah, uh, a sector a sector of society where we're sitting in a, in this ambiguity between a bit of both. I think as a as a profession, physical therapists uh, have good chance and good reason to believe that that they're uh, having a relatively speaking low impact on the environment. You know, we use methods like communication. 
uh, like touch, like exercise and so forth that doesn't actually need a whole lot of resources. But it doesn't mean that we're somehow ethereal either. We still use stuff, you know, we're having a conversation over the internet now, we're using video, you know, that has an impact and it's, there's some things to be found out, but a potential to be a really low carbon or low resource type of service is certainly there. And comparatively speaking, we're, it's likely, you know, we're kind of likely that we're sitting at a somewhat of a lower scale, but there might be room to reduce further still yeah and maybe it's my inclination to see things as half full especially if if it's coffee um hopefully that coffee cup is full but um i'm my my inclination is to think about the opportunity and the opportunity that we have as philip mentioned is that you know we are we're a fairly fairly low carbon low low footprint profession uh as physiotherapists uh we of course we often still drive to work um, our patients still drive to see us. Can we mitigate that through telehealth um, and utilize our communication through different means where at least we're using the resources that we've extracted from the environment in a more judicious way, more efficient way? Um, can we get our, our patients to utilize active transportation? Uh, by that, I mean walking, wheeling, biking um, more frequently uh, to get more cars off the road. Uh, that's that's good for them. It's good for it's good for their health. It's good for for the natural world uh, in terms of getting cars off the road. Um, and you know, can we get people eating eating uh, food that's locally sourced uh, to try and reduce the uh, uh, the carbon footprint associated with the supply lines? Um, you know, ethically sourced uh, and 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 organic. Uh, I think those are good for human health. They're better for environmental health. And so, you know, we can, we can, uh, many of the, the choices that we encourage our patients to, to make uh, in, in lifestyle medicine actually do have the potential for an, an improved carbon footprint for, for our patients. So, you know, at the individual level, of course, that's, that's important. And, and, and that's only one level. You've got sort of that individual level, and then you've got sort of the meso level, which is supporting efforts to, uh, to monitor the environment, uh, making sure that environmental regulations are enforced, um, uh, keeping an eye on, um, you know, programs that help us spot, for example, emerging pathogens, which has been really important over the last three years. Um, you know, those are all part of, part of, part of kind of that human environment interaction that are really important to human lifestyle. Um, you know, because if we're all in a, in a socially distanced environment, boy, doesn't lifestyle medicine look different? Than, um, than if we're not. And then finally, um, this is where uh, I think physios uh, worldwide really have a, a, a role in environmental advocacy at the, at the sort of governmental level. Um, again, just to advocate for that healthy milieu for movement. Um, you need a healthy environment in which to move. Uh, the environment needs us to move, <laughs> right? That's our potential. That's our, that's our value proposition back to the natural world. Uh, so that we can we can start giving more than we take. It's a really great point, Ty, because I don't think we have fully embraced our political power, at least in the U.S., because we are a pretty significant number of people. And if we did come together on certain topics, maybe this being one of them, we probably could in some ways, especially in certain jurisdictions, influence what's happening in uh, public policy. And as you mentioned, um, this could be a key uh, part of public policy. So do you see, a, do you see um, future generations of physical therapists playing a role in things like um, the design of communities? And you already mentioned, you know, uh, laws and policies, but um, where can we start to fit in in these conversations that, is, that are happening already uh, in government and community places? You know, I hope so. And, and that's been one of the focuses of my own career is to, to help uh, physiotherapists become literate in the issues uh, and literate in the processes. I think those are the two places to start. Um, if you don't understand policymaking, it's really hard to get engaged in it. If you don't understand the policies, they're really hard to engage. Um, and if you don't understand your own value and your, your value proposition and finding, finding mutual wins for among humans, and then of course that win for the environment, then, then it's really hard to tell that story to a policymaker in a way that they'll understand. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think physiotherapists have a have a role with individual patients and clients in helping to to build healthier patients and clients that in in the in that process of of bringing uh, and fostering health um, instead of just managing disease, we're also hopefully fostering health of the natural world in the ways that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think getting involved at the local level is probably the most impactful for, for most, most physical therapists, most physios. Um, and so I know of, of physios who've been on uh, planning commissions, uh, who have been on parks commissions. Um, and you know, I know that's a role that, that, is, that can be valued. And, and I think that, that is sort of under leveraged at this point um, in, our, in our profession, at least here in the United States. And I, I, would, surmise, I would surmise elsewhere. Um, and then again, you know, getting getting folks into um, you know these 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 more country level, global level decision making roles is is of course right now kind of a, a far off dream for me, uh, but something that I don't think is unreasonable uh, given the given the value that we have and that, that we potentially could bring uh, as physios. I can just agree to that and and brief just a sort of by way of anecdote I just supervised uh, two bachelor students here at, at our university that did their bachelor's project uh, on uh, looking at different parts of our city here in the north of Norway and Tromsø it's that place there on the map uh, and uh, um, and what they did was actually they took the there's a kind of cycling strategy here for the city and how the city is looking to develop its cycle pathways and, and those aspects. And what they actually did was to go out and take a kind of urban design research approach to look at some places of the city that were proposed to be worked on by the cycle strategy and analyze them from a perspective of how do they enable or you know disable physical activity, active transport, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did a really kind of interesting, fun, and engaging different type of study as you know future professionals or now fully fully uh, graduated professionals, uh, and and put that together and and did a really good analysis of the places they looked at, and we're now going to look at how we can deliver that to people here, kind of locally in in our city, so they get this feedback and they get you know these these this input from phys physical therapists on how well the city is doing and what might be done to improve and and so on. So that's just one example, you know, I know of another such example that we have also on our, one of our blog posts on the Environmental Physiotherapy Association website, where two students at a university in Australia looked at something quite similar, what the, uh, the kind of active transport opportunities at the university or on campus, but also for travel to and from campus. Uh, and they created this amazing video and, and guide for students and, and faculty uh, to be able to more easily move around and, and to and from campus. And that's been taken up by the university and is now being spread kind of across campus and so forth. So uh, this is not just future stuff. It's already stuff. It's happening. People are doing it. Uh, people are getting involved in more and more really creative ways that also and I really want to emphasize that, that go beyond what we normally think about as physical therapists. It goes way beyond just, you know, active transport or increasing movement. There's a lot more possibilities. And I think a great part of this uh, somewhat uh, urgent, sometimes worrying field, but also really exciting because diverse and because just like full of uh, possibilities of things to explore and contribute to. Yeah. Do you see any downside of therapists starting to, um, I guess, counsel and advise on lifestyle related recommendations. Like for example, if all of us were to um, start to educate on a more plant-based diet, which as, as physios, we really should be doing that. Um, would that have, let's say people would say, well, that'll, ha that'll have an adverse impact on the environment because then we'll have to uh, remove more forests so we can plant more uh, fruits and vegetables, which would use more water so on and so forth. So people like, uh, all these ideas sound good, but we don't really have the, the necessary means to make this happen in a, a environmentally friendly way yet. So people have, there's always someone on the opposite side of the conversation who, um, let's say is maybe a naysayer and um, feels like this is not a fully formed conversation yet, so to speak, for, you know, professionals like us to be engaging in. I love naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 
So, and there's always going to be. And if you, if my, my, my sense, Joe, is that if you, if you have naysayers, you're probably on the right track because you're starting to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to listen to, to naysayers. So I, I've heard people say, you know, maybe we don't have it all together to have these conversations yet. Well, this is where we don't, this is, we have this habit, this mental habit of phys, as physios of thinking we have to solve every problem based on what we learned in, in, in physio school. And, um, you know, there, we have friends that do this stuff who are in public planning, uh, who are in ag, who, um, who can help us engage these questions. And so really, and I think we talk about this a little bit in the book chapter, forming cross-functional, cross-sectoral partnerships becomes really important because we know what we know. Um, but to say we don't have it together to be involved in a conversation is, is not headed in the right direction. We can totally have the conversation. We can totally participate. We may not have all the answers, but I don't think we should be expected to either. Um, there are people who, who know what they know. We need to come to, to some common ground and, and, and to make new friends outside of our profession in order to really think about and I think in this manner, we think about ourselves differently um, instead of thinking about ourselves as this all encompassing, we must have all the answers, which is really kind of the mark of our immaturity as a profession, but that we really need to think about ourselves as these independent practitioners who have all the answers. I think it's, so, I think it's a healthy thing to, to, to figure out what we know and figure out what we don't know, and then to go ask somebody who knows and don't think about that as a sign of weakness, but think about that as a as a marker of professional maturity and strength. Um, and so, so yeah, you know, it's, it, we may not have it all together to know about intensive farming techniques or where to put the roads and stoplights and, you know, how to make the bike crossings work and the structural engineering behind the infrastructure necessary to get a pedestrian over a street without the bridge collapsing. But I don't think that should stop us. Um, I think I think the thing that stops us is ourselves. Philip, tell us about your organization, uh, the Environmental Physiotherapy Group, and uh, some of the work you're doing there and where you'd like to see that expand into. Yeah. Um, so as I told you, those uh, three markers who kind of in my personal life that really got me to this topic you know, after that last one of uh, bumping into this topic strongly in clinical practice and those treatment spaces that I found myself in. Uh, I sat down together with my colleague, uh, Professor David Nichols from New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we talked about this, started writing something, and that eventually morphed into this editorial that we published in mid-2019, calling for more explicit thinking about the relationship between environment and physio uh, in, in our profession worldwide. And we used that occasion to then launch the Environmental Physiotherapy Association uh, as an international network of people who would be interested in, in taking this as an explicit topic and really diving into what its different implications, potentials, and so forth are. Um, that uh, Environmental Physiotherapy Association has now grown into, well, we're going on 800 members worldwide uh, from every continent around the world. Uh, we have uh, physiother anything from physiotherapy students, clinicians, academics of all levels, professional representatives, uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, on board and uh, we just keep growing and actually just today I was looking back over the we have a document in our little executive committee where for a while I managed to track all our different activities and make kind of rubrics of we published this and that and then we spoke here and there and here's another podcast we did and this happened and so forth I actually lost track of everything that's happening uh, about three quarters of a year ago, because there's just so much all the time that I just like, I couldn't deal with trying to enter another 50 things into that document of what we've been doing. But to, to put it simply, you know, we've been, I think we've been very active or we've, we've tried to be really active across research, practice and education and try to understand how this topic and field uh, feeds into all of those and can inform all of those and so on. And so we've done, academic publications, blog posts on mass in different languages. Uh, we've gone really heavy into education right away because we felt that that's a really important uh, area to engage in. Uh, we have a project, uh, the EPT Agenda 2023, where at the moment we have 57 uni physiotherapy universities from around the world that are participating in getting these topics into education. I mean, 57 universities, just to repeat that, that's not that's not little by any means in, in such an effort. And, um, and uh, there's research projects that are going on and 
there's just you know so much happening all the time i really invite people to have a look at the website uh there's loads of material there already um and um it's it's a really colorful palette of anything you can think of in physiotherapy and then related to the environment in some way yeah and just tell people what that url is uh philip uh, yeah it's environmentalphysio.com okay so everyone can check simple, that out but yeah yeah, environmentalphysio.com. Uh, you both, you, both of you work in education. How would you encourage your colleagues in, in academic settings to start to include this in the curriculum in either some, some small or big way? I would say in exactly the way that Todd suggested before. Don't think that you have to know everything in advance or ev know everything before you even get started. It's more about getting started in some simple, small way, somewhere where you're feeling relatively comfortable and then just building on that and engaging with others, connecting to other people, finding out what they've done, what they've struggled with, how they solved the problem and so forth. And really in our education project, it's that process that we're trying to facilitate, just that kind of experience exchange and, and identifying these little pinpoints of where we can get started that, for example, if you're teaching something about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you might be teaching, you might just as well be teaching about air pollution as its main global driver today, right? So if you just make that link, you kind of made a start. And then you can decide, oh, okay, so this is fairly easy. I can build on that by looking at where is air pollution the worst, where is it the least, and so forth. And suddenly you're expanding already. So don't know, don't expect to know everything in advance. We don't have to be perfect. Make a start, a little start somewhere. And then just slowly build on it and and that's really good you know because we have god knows how many thousands of physiotherapy universities schools etc around the world if everyone makes a pretty small start and that amounts to something i i hope so I think, you, know. you know um academics can, can grab coffee with a colleague from another department and, you know you know cold call somebody in public policy public planning um you know cold call somebody in the engineering department who's a civil engineer uh, that's how this stuff happens. Wander into a meeting that you don't normally go to and ask them what they're doing. <laughs> I can't tell you how, how many times that, that I've done that over the course of a career and I've made a new friend outside of my discipline. And, you know, sometimes that goes someplace and sometimes it, you know, sometimes it doesn't, but it, at least, you know, um, and, you know, uh, also for, for practicing clinicians, if you find yourself on a midweek night with a little extra time, show up to a Show up to a hearing you wouldn't normally go to. Go go see what what a zoning hearing looks like. Show up to city council. You know, lots of people are doing it now for lots of different reasons, and and so this this is just as valid a reason as as the next one. So just you know, just showing up to those meetings becomes a little habit forming, I think. Um, and you know, there's there's going to be people who just don't who who for it's just not their cup of tea. You know, they want to be clinical physios. They they want to be practitioners, and that's that's okay. Um, help people restore health. I think if you res help people restore their health, uh, it will have a reciprocal benefit on the environment in the ways that we've been talking about. Um, if, you, if you strive to, to lower your individual footprint, um, again, uh, small, small steps can still matter. And of course, everyone can check out the great chapter you wrote in the book. It's a good place to start if you're a, a physiotherapist or a physical therapist um, in the book called Integrative Lifestyle Medicine in Physical Therapy that both Philip and Todd wrote. Um, I'll point you to that link uh, in the show notes. I want to thank Philip and Todd for being here this week on the podcast. Of course, make sure to share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues who are interested in this topic. And as we close, if you guys can tell everyone how they can uh, learn more about you, why don't we start with you, Todd, if people want to reach out to you or find learn more or learn more about your work? Uh, probably the best way to reach me is on Twitter. Um, I am at Sun's Opening Band which is an obscure Pearl Jam reference that probably could be a post podcast episode to itself. So uh, that's where I'll leave it. For me, Philip. it's, uh, yeah, Twitter is good as well. It's Philip Marriage PT. Uh, it's my first and last name, PT, nice and simple. Uh, although I do also like Pearl Jam. Um, but um, yeah, Twitter is good. LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever you like, really. Uh, any kind of email uh, through the Environmental Physiotherapy Association is great as well. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm usually quick to reply. That's another thing to point out. So I try, I try my best to get in touch as quickly as possible when people have questions and yeah, thoughts and ideas. Yeah. 
of course, I'll link to um, all those um, uh, links in the show notes. You can find it over at the Integrated Pain Science Institute. Once again, I ask you to share this episode with your friends and family on uh, social media. And thanks for joining me and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit IntegrativePainScienceInstitute.com. That's Integrative Pain Science Institute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.